So, first of all, I'm not a sword channel, I'm not an expert, I'm just an enthusiast, but I have a William Wallace sword, so let's talk about it. So what was the Wallace sword, where did it come from, and why do we think it had something to do with William Wallace? So I think the myth that William Wallace carried a massive two-handed greatsword has been pretty well laid to rest by a number of sources at this point. We know for a fact that most swords of that size did not appear until the early 1500s. Swords such as the Zweihander and the Scottish variant, referred to by many as the Claymore, are good examples of this. During Wallace's time, however, swords tended to be a little bit lighter, a little bit smaller, and more wieldable in one hand. In fact, the sword that I am currently holding, uh, which is a scaled-down replica version of the Braveheart sword from the movie, is actually closer in proportion to something that William Wallace might have had access to. So my movie sword is actually more accurate than the Wallace Monument sword. Anyway, so... As a man of property and quality, Wallace probably would have been able to afford a longsword, which is simply a slightly longer sword that can be used in one or both hands, allowing you to use a shield if you wish, or just go with two hands, depending on your tastes and circumstances. So if that's the case, where does the massive five-footer sword in the Wallace Memorial actually come from? There's a story that, after Wallace's execution, Sir John Manteith, the traitor who actually betrayed Wallace to the English, took Wallace's sword back home to Dumbarton Castle, which he was the governor of at the time. There is not any contemporary record to support this, it's just a story, but the fact that the sword was later on in history, in the late 19th century, which I will get to, uh, being kept at Dumbarton Castle does seem to suggest that there could be a little bit of truth to the story. In 1505, a whopping 200 years or so after Wallace's untimely and gruesome demise, King James IV of Scotland actually gave orders for the sword, called Wallace's sword in his letter, to be reupholstered, or rather refurnished with a new hilt, and bound with silk. He also ordered his personal hunting sword, to be refurnished at the same time, making it probable that the sword was kind of regarded as something of a royal property or a relic at this point already. The king also gave orders for the baldric or belt and scabbard of the sword to be replaced. This may have been necessary because, according to the Lanercost Chronicle, after the Battle of Stirling Bridge, William Wallace and his men had captured the hated English treasurer Sir Hugh de Cressingham whom they promptly killed, skinned, and turned into furnishings for Wallace's sword. So they probably had to uh, deal with that because the scabbard was, I don't know, getting flaky or growing hair or something. Heartwarming medieval anecdotes aside, it's important to note that the hilt replacement which occurred at this time is likely the reason why the hilt on the sword looks strangely similar to those found on the great swords of the 16th century. Instead of merely being a replacement of the old crossguard with a matching piece, it is likely an updated design. As for the blade, there is evidence that the sword was repaired at least once in its history between 1505 and the present day. In 1825, the Duke of Wellington actually ordered the sword to be taken to the Tower of London for repair. During that time, it was examined by an expert who reportedly only examined the mountings or the hilt of the, of the sword. Possibly the blade had been detached at that time, that's just my conjecture. Uh, however, he made the very astute observation early on that the sword could not date earlier than the 15th century. But we don't really know what he had to say about the blade hinting, possibly, that the blade was being uh, refashioned. And it's also possible that due to corrosion, you know, parts of it needed to be replaced, but during that process, people took a look at it and said, well, that's not very impressive, and maybe they looked at the Crown Jewel Sword of Scotland or some of the royal swords for state functions in England in Parliament, and maybe they said, well, this is basically a state symbol, let's make it bigger. So the sword quite possibly grew considerably during that time span. 
The blade itself seems to have been made of three different types of steel, which is kind of the first point you'll come across people saying that this is not an exact matchup to the original sword. But interestingly enough, the oldest part of the sword, the, the oldest bit of the blade, closer to the hilt, is actually shown signs of having been hammered flat, as if to conform to the rest of the blade, possibly. The additions to the blade also make it unlikely that this sword could have been wielded at all, given how cumbersome it appears in proportion to its hilt. One of the directors at the Wallace Monument has even remarked that it is rather poorly made as a weapon. Great swords tend to have fairly narrow blades, given the need to be able to actually swing them around with any measure of dexterity. In 1888, Charles Rogers, a longtime William Wallace biographer, actually helped fundraise and build the Wallace Monument atop a hill overlooking Sterling Bridge, and he requested that the Wallace sword be installed there as an exhibit, which it was, and since then it has enjoyed a position of pretty much national symbol status. Now, later on, when the film Braveheart was released, they actually sort of based it on the original Wallace sword, but they changed some of the design features. They narrowed the blade a little bit just to make it a little more wieldy, and also added a Ricasso jacket down here, almost resembling a German spy under, interestingly enough, to give greater articulation of the point of the sword, and mainly just to give it a better visual distinction, I guess. I mean, this this is kind of rare to see on a lot of swords uh, without any kind of protection up here, I should add. So they probably were going for a specific look. The hilt itself is also a little bit less decorous as well, mainly perhaps just to go with the rough peasant image that they were trying to portray for William Wallace. Anyway, the sword as a national symbol has uh, also attracted a little bit of unwanted attention in the form of vandalism over the last century. Early in the 20th century, suffragettes protesting for women's right to vote came in and basically smashed the glass of the casing surrounding the sword. Later on, the sword itself was stolen by a group of Scottish nationalists who not too long afterwards actually returned it when they realized how upset their fellow Scots were getting over the robbery. <laughs> And, of course, just last month, the casing was again vandalized by a climate activist group that actually released a short message acknowledging the contribution of William Wallace to the fight for Scottish freedom and the contribution of the suffragettes who had earlier vandalized that very same exhibit. And then they left. The sword of Wallace continues to be a sword of mystery. We don't know what parts of the sword, if any, are in fact original to the sword Wallace carried. It's possible that one section of the blade, a very old and possibly reshaped piece of steel, might have been original, but we can't know for sure. In the end, we have to ask the question, if every component of the sword, except maybe just one, has been replaced, is it really the same sword at all? Or does it matter? Let me know in the comments, like, subscribe. I will hopefully be back with our regularly scheduled content of the Mad Poets Henry V. Hope to see you there, and until then, thank you for watching. I am the Mad Poet himself.